There comes a time in the life of a congregation of God's people that we see how spiritually minded we are. We'll see spiritually mindedness that has developed into character of individuals, especially the men of our congregation. Deacons do not come out of the sky automatically in a miraculous way. They come by abiding in the word over time and allowing the word to form character that's in the heart of the men and they live it in their lives. It comes out in the relationship with their families. I'm saying that the time has come when we'll get a picture of just how spiritually minded this church is. Because we have been asked to put names down, to serve as deacons. What are we asking these men to do? Who are they? I want us to look at the word itself. We are all bond servants of God if we are Christians. And we are his slaves, but in a good way because he's a good master. But the word that we see here is a lot of times looked upon as ministering to someone. It's a more of an idea of service, not indebtedness, but of service that is needed from time to time. It is a mark of what Jesus says, this is a mark of greatness to be a servant ministering to others. In Mark 10 and verse 43, it's not so among you, but whosoever would become great among you. They're not going to be exercising authority like the previous verse is, like the leaders of the Gentiles. But who will be great among you shall be your minister. It didn't say be your slave. It didn't say be your bondservant. But be your minister. It's where we get this word, deacon. It's transliterated from the, the Greek. They just take it right over into English. And will be your minister. Whosoever will be first among you shall be a bondservant of all. There's our bondservant but minister distinction. What does the Son of Man do? The Son of Man also came not to be ministered to, but to minister. And what did he do? Give his life a ransom for many. If it wasn't for that part of the Lord's ministry, we wouldn't be saved. We would have no hope. But he ministered to our need. He paid the ransom price so that we could bought, be bought from the slavery of sin. So that's the concept. It is the idea of service. And that is needed. A lot of us are going to restaurants today. Some looking forward to going back to restaurants. But you get a menu, there's your wish list. You're hoping that the cook will be proficient and will make things flavorful to you. That's back there. But you're not going to get that food. You're not going to have what you want on your, wait, uh, your, your wish list until the waiter or the waitress comes out and delivers it. There's your ministry that you need at that time. It's one thing, oh, I'd like to have that. I think he's a good cook, but nothing happens. This is the ministry that makes things happen. It's not taking authority of leadership or the souls of people. It's ministering to the needs of the people, the congregation at that particular point. So while the word deacon is not used in Acts the sixth chapter, the concept of this service is. In the early church, the church was multiplying. It was growing. Disciples were being made abundantly as that word had free access into the lives of people. There was a persecution taking place, but apparently there was some neglect taking place among Christians. There were Grecian widows, and there were Hebrew widows. And the Hebrew widows were getting preferential treatment, let's put it that way, to the point that the Grecian widows were being neglected. So here's what the apostles said. 
Verse 2, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not fit that we should forsake the word of God and serve tables. There's your ministry. Well, we, are, we can't forsake the word of God. <laughs> They're going to be praying. They're going to be preaching. But something had to be done. There was a need in the church. Look ye out there for brethren, brethren among you, picking men among you, Seven men of good report, full of the spirit of wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. Just a business. Word of God is the most important thing. Let everything else go. No. Here is the spiritual body of Christ not neglecting the physical needs of its members. Or neglecting any other need that they might have. And so what was decided here... Apostles being led by the, by the Lord, they would be ministering in the word. They're going to be steadfast in verse 4 in prayer and the ministry of the word. And these seven men will be chosen to take care of their needs. It was a very wise move that all of their names are Grecian. They'll be taking care of Grecian widows. And there's some wisdom there. But it was a business that needed to be taken care of. Like the waitress needs to get the food to you and refurbish your iced tea or your water and take care of your needs and be such as says not that it's not a problem, but it's a pleasure. What do you want? That type of loving service is to be set forth by deacons. In Colossians, the fourth chapter, verses seven through eight, there's a man by the name of Tychicus. He's in the ministry, but look at the facet of his ministry. He's not called a deacon, but we see this service being set forth. Tychicus make known you the beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. So he's a faithful minister. There's our concept of our word, but he's also a bondservant of the Lord. Whom I have sent unto you for this very purpose, that ye may know our state and that he may comfort your hearts. He's my minister. He's going to remind you one of the five steps of salvation. He's going to remind you the organization of the church. Now, what's his ministry? He's going to tell them of Paul's state to comfort their minds so they will know what's happening. That was a ministry. Don't let that fall through the cracks. It is a need. And Tychicus was fulfilling that need. Just like deacons fulfill the need in a local church. You don't let the need go unmet. Here were Grecian widows. They're not going to be neglected. And there were people serving, waiting tables, making sure they got their daily needs of food and so forth. So when we think of this word deacons, we're thinking what our elders have asked us to do, to submit names of men to serve. But in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 10, they first must be proven, as the text read to your hearing, was be tested. Who are first proven. And what do we mean by that? They must meet God's standard. Where do we read about that standard? We, he had it read for you in your hearing this morning. But we'll take it in detail. In this lesson. Because in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, we see the standard. So take from your mind what standard you have for deacons. Elders deal with spiritual things. Deacons deal with physical things. That's about all I know. He's, he deals with physical things pretty well. I think he'd be a good deacon. No. You need to think deeper of that. That's not the standard that God gives. That here are needs in a spiritual body, that may be a lot of times physical needs, but they must indeed be met. And there's a distinction between elders and deacons. We'll talk about that in a few moments. So how do we write the names? Those names mean something. They express identification of a character, of character. And when we sum up what these particular characteristics are, you can divide them into two areas. Because we'll see most of them are personal character. Their character, who they are, who they are from inside that, ref that is reflected in how they live on the outside. 
And they're also going to have to be married men with children. Those are the two areas that we examine in these verses that are essential to one being put on a piece of paper you, or you're going to have or text someone to elders. That's, that's what must be meeting the test. And when you get through, there, there are really going to be 12 examinations that you make on each individual that you list. You got to make them because they're here in the text. And we want to put them in the order in which they occur. And we will deal with one area where uh, these 12 will occur, but it, we'll see how it is used. But we must examine. That's why I'm saying, well, well, I don't know. <laughs> well, you've got to look at how people have been living before you, how they have acted about God's word. You've got to be observing their conduct and observing uh, their family, as you can see them. And God says, I want you to look at his standing before his family and how he's leading them. And I also want you to look at his personal character. Because it's not going to be, well, we're going to prove them. They'll be on probation for six months and see how they work out. You like to get married like that? See if it works out? No, we make our choices based upon making judgments about character. But God says, look at their home and how they relate, how they're leading. Look at their personal character. They meet the test, serve as deacons. So let's look at them. First of all, they must be grave. And that's a different word we don't like to think about. Why well, start off with that one? Because Paul does. The Holy Spirit does. Deacons in like manner, as they're going to meet certain characteristics like the elders in verses 1 through 7 do. Though the qualifications are different, work is different. In like manner, and upholding this standard of God, let him be grave. What does that mean? He means he's not silly anymore or not silly at all. He's not frivolous. Things just roll off and he just doesn't take anything seriously. No, he's serious, but in a dignified way. We find earlier in 1 Timothy 2 that we're to pray that for kings and those who lead us, that we may live tranquil and quiet lives in all godliness and gravity. Godliness is a serious business. And one that does it with gravity wants to live that life of a Christian. It's not frivolous. It's not something that's not important, not essential. It is very important to them. They're serious about this life as a Christian. And they express that. It's in their character and it comes out in their demeanor, how they interact with you, how they interact with other people. Are they frivolous? Are they silly? Doesn't mean that you don't, can't have a good sense of humor. But there's some seriousness and some dignity about how a man conducts himself. Titus 2, two older men are to have this quality too. They're, they're to be patient, Aged men, they're, they're to be involved in being temperate, grave, sober-minded, sound in faith, in love, and patience. So they're to be grave. Temperate means circumspective around, about, about them, keeping their mind alert. But they're to be grave. They're to be dignified. There's dignified men in, when they're old. There's dignified men when they're younger. How do they go about their life. <clears throat> and we're able to observe that in a local congregation. They're not double tongued. They're not double tongued. And this is the, where it occurs in our New Testament. What does double tongue mean? It's saying one thing to another and on the same subject, saying another thing about that subject to another person. Double tongued. 
Wouldn't it be a horrible situation that if one becomes a deacon and hears someone needing assistance and you're asked to go take care of that assistance and you assure them that we're going to take care of that and then you go to somebody else and say, that's funny, it's, it's silly, I don't know why they want that. You're a double-tongued person. You're not going to serve as a deacon in this church. Because what we say to one person, we might say, well, I want you to know we're going to take care and then you make fun of them behind their back? Are you discredit them in any way to other people? Say another thing to the elders? And it's there to deceive. Double-tongueness is there to deceive for whatever motive you have. And that's no place in the Lord's church of one serving as a as a deacon. And I want to tell you, there's no place for one to be in a church like that either. That's why we change. Character is being developed. And if we can't keep our story straight to whoever we talk to, in order to be accepted by whatever group there is, we better work on that. Women and men. Because this is not the character of one that stands out to serve as a deacon. Thirdly, we're not to be given to much wine. We're not talking about those who have a problem with alcohol. They're, they're drunkards. They're addicted. It word literally means to hold our mind and our attention upon the wine. That becomes what makes you get up in the morning, what you're going to do. You're going to provide when I'm going to have that drink, when I'm going to have this drink. You're always thinking about that drink. Addiction. Why would that be something important? Because God wants men to serve him with a clear mind. He doesn't have another slave owner. He was redeemed from sin. But here is living life, especially when wine can become fermented a lot of times in those days. Jesus is considered a drunkard. But what was a drunkard? He was a gluttonous man, Luke 7, 34. You had to drink a lot of the wine that become naturally fermented to get drunk, but some did that. Some did that. And Jesus was accused falsely of being a drunkard and a gluttonous man because he drank and he ate. Romans 14, 21, apparently it is something that we need to be taken seriously because we can cause a brother to stumble. If wine causes my brother to stumble, I'm not to drink it. Apparently, Timothy took that to heart because he had to be exhorted to drink a little wine, 1 Timothy 5.23, for his stomach's sake, for medicinal purposes, because he wasn't drinking at all. Why? Because he cared about his example, I believe. He didn't want to cause anyone to stumble, and we can stumble in that. And it's interesting to me that in the role of a spiritual body called the church, that these physical things that happen to us, that grab our attention, that, that control our minds and control our decisions we make out here in the world, that we call, that's, that's secular stuff, that's physical stuff. That's where we live. And people can get addicted to a lot of things, but that to be addicted to much wine was something that was to not be the characteristic of people. And people would observe that. They could observe that in the early church, just like we can today. Because why do you want a distraction? Why do you want something else controlling us? And see, that is to be the characteristic of a Christian. None of us should be given too much wine. That's something we have to battle. But out of that group of people who are battling it, and right at that, in, in the time of their life, they're not given to that. They don't have that kind of addiction. They don't have a greed for money either. Because money is motivating them to make decisions and therefore you better watch that. You need to observe. Are they all about making the money? They might not think it's wrong to have dishonest gain if the bottom line is their money. 
And so not greedy of filthy lucre, sordid gain, dishonest gain. Cut the corners here so we can make a profit. You don't want them serving as deacons. You don't want them to be living as so-called Christians either. And so out of this body of people, pick out those among you that have this good report and full of the wisdom and so forth. Here's what you're to do. Look out from among you and notice that three of these first four is what they're not. Is what they're not. Do they have issues that says the Lord is not in total control of my life? They could put on a good air like Judas in John 12 and verse 6. When Mary anoints Jesus with fragrant oil and ointment, that could have been sold for 300 denarii, almost a year's wage, could have been sold and given to the poor, Judas says. He looked good. But what was driving him that's just more money in the bag so I can take. Because God says he's a thief. He was taken from that bag, enriching himself. He was an apostle. No doubt did miracles. Walked with Jesus. But you better look closely because he's not going to be your deacon. He may be an apostle, but he's not going to be a deacon of the church. And he wouldn't stay as an apostle long either. Because he had a distraction. He had something governing him called money and not Jesus, who he professed to follow. And we can become addicted to things through drugs, alcohol, sex, pornography, all the perversions. That can control our lives, every one of them. And while we realize what controls their life, it's God. It's the Lord. And you know what? I can respect that man. He's full of dignity. He's full of dignity. And that's where we are so far. Do we have men like that? They're not separated from the faith. I mean, that is what they hold to. And that's why they don't have these other distractions in their lives. They hold to the mystery of the faith. That means they've grasped hold of the gospel. How do you hold fast to something that you don't know? It's a mystery. Does that mean I can't know it? No, the mystery's been revealed. Ephesians 1, 9, what's been revealed is the mystery of God's will. That Christ was going to be summed up in all things, whether on heaven or upon earth. He sums it all up. All mankind need to come to grips with this. That the most important thing in history is Jesus Christ. And the most important decision you make, well, I'll follow Jesus. He's knocking at my door. Wanting me to become a Christian. Am I going to follow him or not? You make your choices. But the gospel, the mystery of God's will has been now revealed. It is called the mystery of Christ in chapter 3 and verse 4. That Paul said, I know, I've received it by revelation. He's writing it unto them. He's received that. It's the mystery of God's will, summed up in Christ. It's the mystery of Christ. Chapter 6 and verse 19, it's the mystery of the gospel. That's now been revealed. That's why you can hold on to it. It's there to be understood. It's summed up in Jesus. And I've turned my life over to him. It's not about money. It's not about wine. It's not about any other thing that can track my attention. I am serious about living this life. And I still got my great personality. And you can, we can have fun. But this is serious. And that's what we begin to see. They hold fast to that faith. And it's not in theory. It's, it's in practice. Because what they do, they apply it 
to their life. Here's the revealed gospel. This is how I should live, and now I'm applying it. That's why you're holding to it. I'm holding on. This is how it's reflected in my life. I'm holding fast to that mystery. I'm not going to let go, and my life is going to change. My life is being governed in a dignified way in the gospel revelation. And I apply it with a pure or clean conscience. Just how thorough is that gospel in the heart of the man you're about to choose to be a deacon? Before it ever comes out where people can say, I see, the, I see him, I think he's got that kind of character. Before every action, before every thought, it is filtered through his conscience. The conscience that is put in every individual, and if we don't brand it with a hot iron and sear it, it will be helpful. And with a, with a man that's going to be a deacon, and with a deacon, it's there. Paul says, I've lived before God in all good conscience unto this day. Acts 23 and verse 1. Well, it wasn't that he wasn't perfect, they, they was perfect, never sinned. But the point is, is that as a Christian, we can get right with God before the world even knows it. We take care of it. Because we're humble before God. Not trying to be attractive to men. Humble before God. God, this is wrong what I've done. Forgive me. Create in me a clear heart, a clean heart, oh God. This conscience, I have the guilt of me, take away that sin. When I became a Christian, I know that the blood of Christ continues to be available to me. You said that in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. That if I confess my sins, you're faithful and righteous to forgive me of my sins. That blood continues to be there when we continue to confess. And we can make ourselves right with God every day. And we can take care of things before the world ever has an opportunity to see it. Or if they do, you could tell them, I repented of that. That's the kind of man we're talking about. He doesn't need a preacher to point out his error. Unless he's done things in ignorance. And he said, I want to know. I want to learn. He is that close holding to that mystery of faith that he's applied in his life. And when he fails, and we all do, we're not looking for sinless men. We're looking for men who hold the mystery of the faith, applying it to the best of their ability, and always keeping a clear, clean, pure conscience. And that's what you do within, inside yourself, men and, and women. Especially in the context here of Men serving as deacons in the masculine form. So that's a positive. Being grave is a positive of what we're supposed to be. And we've got three things that we're not supposed to be. But all of them are connected with this mystery of faith. So what happens? Let them then be proven and let them serve as a deacon if they be blameless. If they don't meet this standard... There, they have, there's, there, there's a question about maybe that characteristic. Then they're not blameless. Blameless means above reproach. They're not even questioned about that being a part of their life. Negative. And it's not a question that they don't have those characteristics in the positive. But when they are proven by that standard of God and tested... Let them serve as deacons. But we have some more qualifications, and that gets he's got to be a married man with children. He must be a one woman kind of man. Literally, it's what the Greek says. He must be the husband of one wife. In that day, he would not be a polygamist, or in this day, but especially in those days when. Men had multiple wives. He's not maintaining concubines, having a lot of women to satisfy his needs. 
and according to what we see in the New Testament, would be un, not unlawfully divorced and remarried because he'd still be bound to the wife, even though he's got divorce papers, even though he's been divorced or divorced others, or divorced his wife. And if it's not for the right reason, he would still be bound and not free from that wife. He's the husband of one wife. And my question is that all of a sudden in verse 10, and women, some of your versions have their wives. How come it's woman or women? And how come it's wives or wife? How come that's in different translations? Don't you know the difference between a woman and a wife? Yeah. But the term is the same in the Greek language. Context will determine it. Matthew 5, 28, I'm not to look upon a woman to lust after her. Is that a married woman or single? Either one. But verse 32, don't you put away your wives, except for the cause of adultery. You're putting away your women. It's just verse, verse close together. Context will determine. That must be your wife. This must be any woman. Others have taken this because women were to be deacons. Phoebe in Acts 16 and verse Romans 16 and verse 1 is indeed a servant of the church. But she can never be a husband of one wife, and that's what would be deacons. So some translations have her as a deaconess, a feminine form of deacon. She was a servant of the church. Remember servanthood, and here is, is not the idea of I'm a bond servant, but I'm offering service. And there were things that women could do on certain situations. That would be something maybe a church would have woman take care of that other woman's personal needs. And they would do that. Phoebe was a minister, was a servant to Paul and to the church and the, and the word of God. She wasn't preaching the gospel in the pulpit or taking a lead over men that way. But she was serving, helping the church in some way. But here, all of a sudden, we find husband of one wife, and then in verse 12, we come back, deacon, back to a deacon. So what is this woman? I think some of the translations have it right. What is his wife like? What are the wives of the deacons like? And notice, they're also grave, dignified. They don't slander they're not accused. They're not bringing forth lies or being a slanderer that passes false information about that. They're temperate. They're vigilant. Well, that, they, will, they won't be addicted to much wine, too. That's right. But they're temperate in their demeanor. They're, they're circumspective. They see what's around them. And they're faithful. They're trustworthy in all things. You take one of those qualities of a wife of a deacon and you're going to have trouble you're going to have trouble because he's going to be dealing with things that are very personal dealing with things that needs have to be met it might deal with money it might deal with physical health it might deal with with things of their possessions of taking care of certain needs and you've got a wife that is a slanderer and is not going to be that faithful in things, you've got a help that's not much of a help as a wife. Especially in the work of a deacon. I think that's why he speaks about wives here, women. Not that they hold an office of women deaconesses. All I see is deacons husband of one wife. But wives have a very important role to play in the life of elders and the life of deacons. An elder, we don't see this as far as the life of a, a deacon, an elder must be hospitable. Well, who's going to help with being hospital with hospitality? A woman is geared for those things. Doesn't mean that she has to do all the work. 
but she can assist. She can be a help. And there's sometimes that women need to keep their mouths shut of what they've going through and the lives of their elders, husbands, and, and deacons to be faithful and trustworthy. And she's on the same page with God. And what it is to be a deacon's wife in our consideration this morning. So that's the life of a Christian. <laughs> When are we not supposed to be faithful in all things, women? When are we not to be temperate? When is it okay to be a slanderer? When is it okay to just be silly all your life? This is growing to maturity. I said, this is a test to see how spiritually minded and how we have grown spiritually in this church. And the elders want us to make some choices without leaving the role of a deacon just emphasizing his wife, he comes back that the deacon that's going to be serving as a deacon, he must be ruling his children and his household well. We're not talking about a dictator. And we're not talking about somebody that lets, lets the wife take care of things. The word literally means to stand before with dignity that the family respects, the wife respects, the church is therefore going to respect. He's full of, of, of seriousness, gravity. And he stands before his family. He's a good manager of his home. He's leading. He's assisting. He's protecting. And what we see as a congregation without being busybodies, what we see is that that comes through. We see that in the family. We see that in the children. Are they behaving because they're going to get whipped to death at home? I'm not saying you, not to spank your children. But elders are supposed to have wire, uh, children that are in submission to them with all gravity. There's our word dignity. It's not because they are dictators and I don't want to get beaten up again. But they're fathers leading the way with chastisement, yes but with loving chastisement, correcting them along the way. And people can see the difference. And you, as you live your life, you're, as, you're not trying to just show the world so you can get an office and have, have a position. That's the way we're all supposed to be living our lives anyway as Christians. And that stands out, and there comes a period of time that so we need... <coughs> Servants of the Lord with special needs that we need to fulfill in this church. And that's where we look. They rule their children and their household well, being leaders. I think we can tell the difference. So this morning, we've looked at, these are 12. You got four with a wife. The rest of them are character, and he's a married man with children leading. It didn't say that they had to be believers like Titus says about elders. It didn't say that they had to be teachers who can take a debate and take apart the, the teachings of a false teacher, which elders are should be able to do. These could be younger men that haven't had children at the age of being Christians yet. Elders are to rule over the flock. Deacons are not to rule, they're to serve the flock. So there are different roles. But what amazes me that these roles that we thought, well, you know, it's not about the word of God and going to heaven. It's about, hey, am I going to get a meal today or not? Who's assisting in this? And with a church with different needs, we hit that as well. And so what we began to observe is that deacons, here's what God sets forth to you. When you serve well as a deacon, you gain good standing. Not only have people seen that in your life and you have manifested it, now you put it into action and they see how you relate to the needs of a local church and you gain good standing. You step up, not to step up, well, next place I'll be an elder. No, you may never be an elder. So what? I want to be a servant. And you step up and you stand on a higher plane because you publicly were observed by the public 
They trusted you. You had the respect and you fulfilled it. You fulfilled it. You're in good standing. And you follow the teachings of the Lord. It even makes you more bold in the faith. And it's all about Jesus. That's who you're connected with. And when that happens, that is a wonderful blessing. You're going to spend your life doing something in this world. You're going to spend your life, hopefully that every male here is going to be a Christian. You don't have to be married to go to heaven. You don't have to be having children, women to, to go to heaven. But all of these qualities of elders and what we've seen today as deacons, those are the qualities outside the home qualifications that every child of God should manifest in their life. That's why I'm saying we're seeing just how spiritually minded we are. When it comes time, such times as this, choose some men you think are qualified to be deacons. Because when we have our elders and deacons that are qualified and are serving, that's the church that Paul would write to. When he wrote to the Philippians, he said to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are at Philippi, let's put part view there. Can we do that? Yes. With the bishops and deacons. We have men serving in those areas. Our elders, our bishops, our overseers, our shepherds says, as we look to the future, we need some men now to serve as deacons. And I want us to be encouraged that when we do meet these spiritual tests, when asked for, it says we are growing. That we've been listening. That we've been developing. And it comes out where people can write your name to say you're qualified to fulfill a role that God wants in his church. To have qualified men serving as bishops and deacons, and they're all saints, is a great quality to have. I hope Paul could write us a letter like that and continue to do so in the years ahead. So I trust that you will think soberly, pray about it, pick the names that you think are named, that you think are qualified to serve, that fit the test of what you see from God's word. Give those to the elders and we'll make progress. Those of you who are not in Christ, you're outside of Christ, we encourage you with the word. Evangelism is to spread the good news, to be ministers of the word, preach the word. That's what I'm to do. And we're to be urgent in season, out of season. We reprove, we rebuke, we exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Because this word is the only thing that can save us and guide us and to give us strength. And we've used it today of how we're going to choose our deacons. But if you're not a Christian, we're going to sing a song that Jesus is knocking at our door. Who at the door is standing? It's Jesus Christ. He wants to be invited into your home, into your heart, abide with you and you abide with him. He wants to take away your sins, take away the guilt of sin that you have by the washing of his blood and baptism. And to rise up to walk a newness of life. Where you start putting that word into your life. And maybe one day, men, you'll serve as a deacon or an elder. Or an elder or a deacon. One day, you will serve as a wife to one of those. One day, you'll serve as just a, a Christian. Doing service. Because you know that's the mark of greatness. And you may never even be noticed by anybody else. So what? We're serving the Lord. And that's the life that we invite you to have. Forgiveness of sins, hope of salvation, and a life of service. Won't you start now? Come to Christ as we stand and as we sing.